Good day. Welcome to First Take exclusively on YouTube. To my left, Christopher Mad Dog Russo in a fantastic suit. Stephen A. Smith live from Vegas covering the in-season tournament. All right, guys, and that's where I want to start with the NBA. Milwaukee earned their bucks last night after beating the Knicks 146-122 and advancing to the semifinals. Despite the 41-point effort from Julius Randle, Giannis and Dame stole the show, combining for 63 points. Kenny and Chuck sounded off on the Knicks last night. Take a listen. This is why the Knicks are going to stay in the middle. Every game that they play, they always have the second best player. You play Boston, you got the second or third best player. You play Orlando with Ben Carroll. They don't have a player that's better than Ben Carroll. Milwaukee, we know they don't. Philadelphia, they don't. The Indiana Pacers, Tyrese Halliburton is the best player on the floor, if you say that. Correct. If you play the Miami Heat, Jimmy Butler is the best player on the floor. You play the Cleveland Cavaliers, you have Donovan Mitchell. Donovan Mitchell. Yeah. You don't have the best player on the floor no night. Now, they can play better than you, but they are not walking into the gym and saying, You have no That's margin for player. error. Right. That's why I said, I said the first night, I said, the Knicks need to make a trade. I was going to say one thing before we start. Kenny's suit, Stephen A., fantastic. Great color. The tie clip, the pocket square, the emerald green. It's good stuff. Uh, Stephen A., do you agree I with Kenny? I paid no attention to it. Okay. Do you agree with Kenny and Chuck on your Knicks? Yeah, yes, and that's why I paid no attention to his suit. See, when the Knicks are brought up, I go blind. Oh. Because I go blind with fury. Because they're absolutely correct. Kenny Smith and Charles Barkley are absolutely on point. Doggy, I don't know if you noticed, they played the clip of me yesterday from 2020 because I lost it on social media years ago because I was begging the Knicks to draft Tyrese Halliburton. I said, wow. you don't need another forward, but you draft an OB top and four. This kid is the real deal, and you need a point guard. Yeah, you went out and got Jalen Brunson later, and we get all of that. But nobody's looking at Jalen Brunson as fantastic as he is in assuming that you're better than Halliburton. And if you had gotten Halliburton, then you could have went all in on getting Donovan Mitchell instead of Leon Rose stupidly trying to bluff Danny Ainge of Utah, arguably one of the greatest, if not the greatest executive in the game today. And so when you do that and you've got you've accumulated 11 picks over the next seven years, you got to use them for what the hell you holding on to them for. You taking them to the grave with you? You ain't going. What are you doing? You got to use those assets to go out and get somebody. They are absolutely right. The Knicks never go into a game where their player is the best player on the basketball court. And that's the damn problem. That's why they're 10-0 and 0 against teams that are, five, that are less than 500, and they're 2-8 and 8 against teams above 500 this season. You know why? Because of the, what, what they just pointed out last night and what I'm just saying. I'm totally disgusted because, again, the worst thing to be is in the middle, doggy. See, oh. when you stink – 100%. What happens is you're ultimately able to position yourself in the picked. draft and beyond. Or you're elite. You're contending for a title. The yep. worst place to be is in the middle of the road because you can't get the assets necessary to get what you want without assistance from others. That's the, the situation that the Knicks find themselves in. And they're hell-bent on holding on, doggy. I know this for a fact. It's about the marathon. It's not about the spring. We're building something here. We're building it. You know who says that, doggy? That's people who are more interested in keeping their jobs, more so than they're interested in doing their jobs. Yeah, See, I agree with you. See, when you convince everybody for the long right. game, right, then you get time, as opposed to being under the pressure cooker to provide results. Now, I respect the hell out of Leon and Worldwide West and all of them, but I'm sick and tired of looking at New York being in this situation. I'm proud of the job Thibodeau's done. I know they're a good team. But they are not a part of the championship equation. When you got 11 damn picks, go out there and utilize it and get us a star at the Garden, for crying out loud, or stop calling it the Mecca. Now, I agree with you 100%. Listen, Boston's got two Hall of Famers, maybe three, and, of course, uh, Brown and Tatum. Embiid's a Hall of Famer, and the Bucks have Giannis and Lillard now. They're, they got two Hall of Famers, and Knicks don't have a Hall of Famer. And Stevie hit it right on the head. Utah had this problem for a long time, too, in the NBA. The worst place to be in this league is stuck in the middle. The Knicks, the best they can expect, 46-47 wins. Maybe they beat the Cavs in the first-round playoff series a la last year, but they are not going any further than that. And eventually, I understand that the Knicks were so bad for so long, even winning a first-round playoff series was a big deal. But eventually, that's going to wear out, where fans are going to say, this is all I got. 
I got a couple of home games, and then I lost to Miami, or I lost to the Celtics, or I lost to Philadelphia in round two. That's going to wear thin. And Stevie is 1,000% right. Randall's a decent player. He's not a great player. Brunson's a very, very good player, but he's not a great player. And there's other great players in that conference. Butler's a great player. Tatum's a great player. Reggie Brown's a great player. Embiid's a great player. There's too many great players in that conference that the Knicks don't have, and they have to end up beating in the postseason, and they can't do that. They are forever right now stuck in that 45 to 48 win total yeah. where they get knocked out at best in the second round. And after a while, fans get very sick of that. Stevie's 1,000% correct. Right. All right, let's move on here, guys. Uh, I want to play some comments here for you and, and have you react. Take a listen. One of his best friends was the son of the GM. Mm -hmm. So he was around us, practice uh, in the locker room, after games, before games. So he, he heard the different <laughs> language. And we all know it's a different language mm -hmm. when the cameras is not there. Mm -hmm. so that's why he's doing the bully shit, <laughs> the bully he doing now, in my opinion. But no, he, he, he caught all that in our locker room. All right, so that was Pistons legend Rasheed Wallace on the Gilbert Arena show talking about Draymond. Stephen A., will he go down as one of the best defensive players of a generation? I don't know if he will, but I believe he should. He's a four-time champion, and we know how elite Golden State's defense was when they were winning those championships, as much of the sizzle as their offense received because they had the greatest shooter God ever created along with one of the top five shooters in the history of the game. They don't win those championships without defense. And Draymond Green is the catalyst in every way, not only his ability to defend, but also pick up, you know, you know, push the ball up the floor and be the playmaking forward that he is. And obviously he's a motivational leader as well, et cetera, et cetera. You know, people underestimate, Doggy, the importance of talking on defense, making sure that you're a vocal person. That contributes a lot. A lot of times we get caught up in the sizzle. You know, we see Dennis Rodman with his eccentric ways. We saw Bill Russell, the great Bill Russell, an 11-time champion, the winner within. We saw all of that. And there were many, many elite defensive players throughout the years. But when you look at somebody's results and then you just pay attention to them getting the job done, it's Draymond Green. Draymond Green is going to the Hall of Fame because Draymond Green Won, won championships and because a team didn't even resemble themselves whenever he was not on the floor. That's the kind of impact that he has. So he's not going to swat shots like the Dwight Howards did or the Bill Russells did or, or, or guys like that. He's not going to be an elite offensive big man like Bill Walton was and the Wilt Chamberlains and the Shaquille O'Neal's were or anything like that. But when you talk about a guy that's undersized every day that he stepped on the court and he still went out there and was able to facilitate you winning four championships because you could not have done it without him. That's a Hall of Fame career. And obviously he'll be known more for his defense than his offense. And that's why I say he should be, Doggy. Yeah, I would like to have a little more offense in my great defensive players. Michael Cooper, you remember him, Lakers. He was a better offensive player than you think. Robin was the best offensive Not rebounder Robin. outside of Moses Malone I've ever seen. And Wallace, Ben Wallace, did a lot of other things besides just play defense. Yep. You're probably right. Green, uh, he's, he's a very unique player. They won four titles. He's going to be a Hall of Famer. Uh, I probably uh, would agree with that. But let me ask you this. To be fair, Steve, and they put everybody in the Hall of Fame. The Hall of Fame has lost a lot of its cachet because they put everybody in. Let me ask you a question. That's you true. Actually think, you actually think Draymond Green is a Hall of Fame basketball player? Yes. You think he is? Yes. Of, he, yes. he can't throw the ball in the ocean. Yes. You think he's a Hall yes. of Fame player? No, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, yeah. tell me, tell me. Nobody was worse than Dennis Rodman when it came to that. But he was unquestionably a Hall of Famer. He was an elite rebounder and defender. And in this system that they're now living in, <clears throat> excuse me, the game has changed. And it's, it, and it's evolved to such a degree that, again, the, the, the rough and tumble 
kind of atmosphere that existed. That's what I was arguing with Shannon about yesterday, Doggy, when we were talking about that. I said the path to prosperity was far more difficult back in the day because of the mm -hmm. things that were allowed. You had a mugging. Uh, could you imagine if McHale had closed line Rambis in today's game, what would have happened? Oh, he'd, he'd be suspended, suspended for, for 10 games. games. Yeah. He'd be suspended okay. 100%. Yeah, they, 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 I don't, even, I don't Warriors... even remember whether or not he got a technical foul. I don't even remember whether or not he, he got a technical foul Did back. Not. It was just that physical. And, Exactly. And so you look at stuff like that. The game has changed. But because the game has changed doesn't mean that we get to negate and ignore what we saw from other guys who stepped up and showed you that they can make a contribution in today's culture. And I think that's Draymond Green. Draymond Green lost his jump shot over the last few years. That's a given. But he's also a playmaker because think about what they couldn't do offensively without him. Steph Curry had to carry the load, but I'm talking about off the dribble as opposed to being set up to catch and shoot. Why? Because Draymond wasn't there and there was nobody else that could do it. And then on the defensive side of the ball, he's not only defending, but he's also a catalyst for what you do collectively as a defensive unit. Thanks so much for watching First Take Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. on ESPN. And be sure to check out more exclusive debates on YouTube. YouTube.